but I do wash it. <laughs> I love my shirt, so we I only have the one, so we have to wash it before we have church, and and uh, it's just comfortable, and it's my fishing shirt. It reminds me to be a fisherman, not just a real fisherman, but a fisher of men. And so let's get started today. You know, we talk a lot about uh, you know what happened at Calvary and what happened before Calvary, and and all these different things. But today we're going to be talking about from Calvary to Joseph's tomb. What happened? What was it about? And what's the importance of that? You know, and, and what really took place? So we're going to be doing a detailed study, which means you're going to need your Bibles open. And I'm going to encourage y'all to start bringing um, a notebook, just a little spiral notebook, draw a line down the middle, and then put the title at the top, put the, the, the scripture, and then as we go, take your notes all the way down and up. And uh, so let, let's do that now. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, from Calvary to Joseph's tomb, okay? Matthew chapter 27, verses 57 through 66. Now, I say this lovingly, not to put anybody down, but most places, most churches you go to is more or less, you know, it's got three major points in the sermon. It's got a few fillers in there, and within 30 minutes, Brother James are done. A lot of churches aren't doing extensive Bible studies anymore. Well, one of the things that we specialize in here in this ministry, uh, Lady Carol, is we we really just take the Word of God and we bring it out. We give you all the references. That's why you really need to take these notes. And like you've got pen and paper, I mean, pen and Bible, you'll put notes in there that you can read and they're legible and you can follow up on and share with. So really, what is the church? It's, it's the called out ones, the ecclesia. Where, and that's what it means. It means that we are called out. And what are we called out to do? As saved people, we're called out to witness uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ to every lost person that will listen. Now, what do we do after they get saved? Well, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, says what, Brother James? That we're to identify them. We're to, in other words, if we do that through baptism, uh, that's, our first, that's a picture of the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's your first step of stepping up and standing up to be a follower of Jesus Christ, a servant of Jesus Christ, a disciple. So really, the, the, what God asked us to do was to go out and witness. And when we win people, we're to take them in and we're to train them on the gospel and then how to be a witness and then to send them out that they might win others. And that's the whole point is when we get to on the other side, it wasn't how big our church building was or how many buses we ran, even though those are important. And I love a, a church building. I love buses. And it's not about how big of acreage we had. or, But you know what's going to matter is how many people walk through the pearly gates because you shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I just got my box in uh, of gospel tracts. And Brother James is the book of John and in the book of Romans, it's a part of the book of Romans, but uh, we're going to need people to help us go back in and highlight all the things that need to be highlighted and get a rubber stamp and stamp those things so people can be directed to our website at lyitl.org, love you, lord.org. So, the, and there's a place where it says grow, and we want them to go there and 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 get you know, download that, print that out, but then we want to sit down with them for the next six weeks, just one hour a week. And maybe at their home or our home, or maybe at the coffee shop, and just help them to understand about their security in Christ, what they need to do and move forward. Does that make sense? So it's all about making disciples. And we've gotten away from that. And so you guys are here because you 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 love the Lord and you want to honor him but through the resurrection. We know that's a daily thing. But yet you, you want to learn from the word of God. It's not about going and just hearing, a, oh my gosh, wasn't that a great little pick-me-up sermon. And those are great, don't get me wrong. But the best thing we do is get people grounded. Grounded in the Word of God. If you ask the average Christian, where's the Great Commission in the Bible? They don't know. We know it's Matthew 28. Okay? And if we were to ask them, what, what are the four Gospels? Most don't know. And they go to church all the time. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why? Because it records. It records what? Hi, Starlet. Good to see you. Hope you're doing well. So we're going to be talking about from Calvary to Joseph's <coughs> tomb. 
Let's read. Now, you're going to need your Bible. It's going to be an extensive study because what we specialize in in this, in this ministry is not just the hip-hop and hooray messages, but we really dig in the Word of God. We want you to understand it in detail. So let's do that. Matthew chapter 27, verse 57 through 66. Let's begin to read. I do read out of the King James Version Bible. And so, Starler, here we go. It says, it says, when the even or the evening was come, there came a rich man, Arimathea, named Joseph. Okay? So a man of where? Arimathea. What was his name? Joseph, who also uh, himself was Jesus' what? Disciple. Disciples. Now, beside that, put Matthew chapter 28. That's what the Great Commission. So it's not about building buildings. It's not about having huge choirs. It's about, hey, what did we learn about the gospel? Did we share the gospel? Did people get saved? That's what it's about. All right? So in other words, he was a disciple. And it says that he went to Pilate. And what did he do? He begged for what? The body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, now who took the body? Joseph. Joseph he wrapped him in a clean linen cloth. Okay? So how much do you think Jesus weighed? We're going to learn about that today. Did you know that? So look at here. So and when, G when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it on his own new tomb which he had honed out of the rock. So he paid people to dig a hole or a cave in the side of a rock. And so he was he was rich. We know that, that uh, Joseph Arimathea, we learned from Scripture, he was a very rich man, but he hired people to go in and cut this thing out of the rock. I mean, they chiseled it out. And so it was going to be his tomb. But he, of course, he was alive, so he never used it yet. Does that make sense? That's important. Uh, it's based on Scripture. Verse 60. And laid it in his own new tomb. What did he lay? The body of Jesus, which he had honed out of the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. Okay? So he put Jesus in, and he rolled the stone, and then he left. And it says, verse 61, And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation... Remember the preparation of what? Does anybody remember? There's a feast coming up, right? So, once again, it's a Sabbath. There's a weekly Sabbath, a monthly Sabbath, a yearly Sabbath. And so, now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver, they're calling Jesus a deceiver, said, while he was yet alive. Now, notice, while he was yet what? So everybody knew that Jesus was dead. You got this? He's not faking it. They all know he's dead. And after three days, I will rise again. And they reminded Pilate of what Jesus had said while he was alive. So if somebody says, well, Jesus passed out. No, he's dead. If they thought he was alive, they'd have went and got him out of that tomb. Does that make sense to you? Verse 64. And so they asked Pilate, he said, uh, command therefore that the sepulcher, which is the what? Tomb. The, the tomb, the body where Jesus lay, be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night, steal him away and say unto, uh, unto the people, he is risen from the dead, so the last era shall be worse than the first. If people think he's resurrected, it's, oh my gosh, it's going to get out of control. We're going to lose the power of our religious power over the people. Verse 65, Pilate said to them, you have a watch. And now what is a watch? Not talking about a time X. It's a guard. It's a guard. Okay? A special guard. Okay? So you have a watch. Go your way and make it sure as you can. Make it as secure as you can. So they went and made a sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. So they, they put... The wax, they poured hot wax all over the stone and where it was connected to. So if somebody tried to move it, we know that what? That the wax would be broken. And because it's going to have the king's seal on it, then you're going to have to be dealt by the king. And normally that would be by death. 
Okay, now understand that, all right? So if the wax gets broke, the people that are watching it or anybody that tries to move that stone, they're going to die by the hand of the king. He's out, you have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can, all right? And they will seal that little thing up there. Make sure nobody can get in, nobody can get out. Verse 66, so they went and made the sepulcher, sealing the stone and setting a watch, all right? Now, let me give you some extra scriptures here since you have a pen and your Bible. Out beside that, I want you to put Matt, uh, Mark chapter 15, verse 42 through 47. It's important that you read these other scriptures to back up this scripture, okay? Also, Luke chapter 23, verses 50 through 56. So we've got Mark chapter 15, verse 42 through 47, Luke chapter 23, verse 50 through 56, and last of all, John 19, 31 through 42. All right. So, Brother James, you get all that? They can get all that? All right. So, so first thing I want you to understand is the Jews requested that Pilate complete the execution of the thieves and Christ before the Sabbath begins. Because this was the this was the preparation that had to be completed before the Sabbath began. So in, let's read John chapter 19 that I just gave you, verse 31. We're only going to read down to verse 37. And it says, the Jews, therefore, because it was the what? The preparation. What is the preparation for? Preparing for the Sabbath. All right? And he says that the body should not remain upon the cross, on the Sabbath day. For the Sabbath day was a high day. Now, what does that mean? That means, like you and I, oh, we go to church on Wednesdays, we go to church on uh, Sunday, but now we're going to church on Christmas. We're going to church on Easter. It was a high celebration, all right? And it says they besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. So they got up there and they broke the legs of these thieves, and then uh, when the thieves died, they took their bodies down. All right? So verse 32. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which were crucified with him. So they broke both thieves' legs. And when they came to Jesus and saw that he was what? Dead already. They break not his legs. Circle that phrase. Because that's prophecy. But there was no mistake. Now, do you think that a Roman soldier, Brother James, that deals with battle, life and death, that they would know if somebody was alive or faking it? He is dead. Verse 34, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out what? Blood and water. Which means when you have the heart that's filled with blood, it's in a sack. But apparently, and I always talk to people this, I believe that when Jesus died on the cross, I believe he died of a broken heart. And that heart just exploded. So when that thief reached up and touched that, I'm just, that's just my speculation. But when, they, when that spear went into his side, while Brother James, uh, it went over here to his side, there was water and blood mixed. You know, if somebody was faking it, there wouldn't be water and blood. Does that make sense? So in other words, it was mixed. So I believe his his heart just exploded. But that's just my theory, okay? That just makes sense. Even from a medical, I remember a, a preacher that was a, a doctor uh, of medicine. And he talked about it. He said, yeah, that comes from a heart that exploded, all right, from the pressure. So he says here, uh, uh, so verse 34, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water. And, and he, he that saw it, he bear record. And his record is true. And he knoweth that he said that he might believe, right? All right. For these things were done. Now, underline this. That the scriptures should be what? Fulfilled. What was one of the scriptures? A, a bone of him shall not be broken. This is important, guys. Verse 37. And again, another scripture said, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Not everybody on the cross, uh, on the crosses, that this happened. Only Jesus. But these were prophecies. 
So the Jews had just viciously, horribly, horrifically murdered a man named Jesus. But now they expressed their pious concern that the body be what? Removed lest the Sabbath be polluted. Is that crazy? Well, we're going to go to church on Sunday. We're going to kill this guy on Saturday. We're going to beat him. We're going to mar him. We're going to rip his hair out of his face. Oh, we're going to do all... Brother Jay, we're going to... Oh, it's going to be the worst execution you've ever seen. But now we're going to go to church on Sunday. We're going to praise Jesus. Does that make sense to you? This is what religion often leads to, is a self-pious, I'm better than somebody else. You know, we're going to just do the most horrible thing you can think to a human being. Oh, we got to get them down off this cross so that we can have our Sabbath and on the holy day and we can go back just to being our self-righteous people that we are. Because we don't want to pollute the Sabbath. I'm going to pause there for a moment. We as Christians do the same thing. We sometimes we live like we're demons sometimes and we do, I mean, we don't, we don't measure up to the gospel. We don't measure up to being a witness. We don't measure up. And this is where most people will turn me off. That we don't measure up. But we're going to go to church and praise Jesus on Sunday. I'll just stop there for a moment. <laughs> the soldiers find the two thieves still alive after they went up there. And, and so they broke their legs. And the soldiers find Jesus is already dead. And they pierced the side with a spear, and then they gazed upon him. What? Can you see scriptures unfolding here? Prophecy? So the Jews requested that Pilate complete the execution. They're not dead yet. Complete the execution of the thieves and the execution of Christ before the Sabbath began. And the Old Testament prophecy is now being fulfilled. That his bones would not be broken. So, Brother James, why didn't they break the bones of Jesus? He's already dead. Fulfilling prophecy. So, we're going to look at three. Remember, I told you it's a Bible study. And that's what separates us a lot of times from a lot of the other things that happen on Sunday. And I'm not running anybody down. I'm just saying we specifically specialize in, uh, and breaking the Bible down to where everybody says, wow, I never saw that before. We talk about Calvary. We talk about before Calvary. But what about from Calvary to the tomb, to Joseph's tomb? That's what we're talking about today. Psalms 34, 20. He keepeth all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. Everybody say prophecy. 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 Psalms 34, 20. Not a bone was broken. Prophecy, Exodus chapter 12, verse 46. In one house shall it be eaten, and thou shalt not carry forth out the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. So they're going to go back in and have the Sabbath, and they're going to take and, and kill it. They're going to bleed it. They're going to partake of it, but not a bone of that animal can be broken. Everybody say prophecy. All right, Numbers chapter 9 Verse 12, they shall leave none of it unto the morning, nor break any bone of it, underline it, nor break any bone of it, according to all the ordinances of the Passover, they shall keep it. They're going to keep the Passover, just don't break a bone. So Jesus, remember the Passover lamb was a picture of the Passover, the real Passover lamb. And Jesus is the Passover lamb of God. Not of man, but of God. Let me give you some scripture. Let's look at John chapter 19. We're reading a lot of scripture today. John chapter 19, verse 33 through 36. Lady Carol says, but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was what? Dead already. They break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, for with came there out blood and water, and he that sat, uh, saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that, uh, uh, that he uh, that saith true, that you might believe. In other words, we believe he's died, he's dead, right? And also believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? For these things were done that the what? The scriptures should be what? Brother James, fulfilled. So 
A bone of him shall not be broken. This is important, guys. You see, this is what validates that Jesus was, is, and always will be the sacrificial lamb. He's also the Messiah. He fulfilled every scripture, even the ordinance of the Passover. So the Jews request that Pilate complete the execution of the thieves and Christ before the Sabbath began and the Old Testament prophecy fulfillment that his bones would not be broken and the Old Testament prophecy, uh, prophecy fulfillment that he would be stared at at death. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. And I will pour out the house of David upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications and they shall look upon him. What? They shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Everybody say prophecy. Get this? And they shall look upon him whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Imagine you've only got one child, and that child's been killed. How angry you would be, right? Right? John 19, verse 37. And again, another scripture said, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. So Victoria say prophecy. So we're talking about from Calvary to Joseph too. Is this powerful? It is, isn't it? So the Jews what? We know that the Jews requested that Pilate complete the execution of what? The two thieves and of Jesus Christ before what? The Sabbath began. Number two, the Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled that his bones would not be broken. Number three, we've learned that Old Testament prophecy that he would be stared at at death. And now number four, Joseph at Arimathea is going to boldly ask Pilate for the body of Jesus. Matthew 27, verse 57. When the evening was come, he says even, or in other words, we're going to translate that evening. When the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, whom also himself was, a, was Jesus' disciple. Mark 15, we're talking about Joseph Arimathea is going to ask for the body, right? Mark chapter 15, verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, very prestigious, right? Which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went what? boldly unto Pilate and, and craved the body of Jesus. In Luke chapter 23, verse 50 through 52, And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and just. The same had not consented to the counsel and the deed of the other. Words, he, when everybody got together and said, we're going to kill Jesus, he said, I'm not going to be a part of this. Okay? And so uh, it says, but he was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. He knew that Jesus was the king of that kingdom, and that when Jesus died and arose, according to what he said, that, that Jesus was going to issue his kingdom in. So he's waiting for that, just like you and I are today. So this man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. In John chapter 19, verse 38, Starlet says, And after this, Joseph Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, and he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. Now notice, we have a lot. He was afraid that if he stepped up and said, Hey, I'm a disciple of Jesus, that he'd be killed. So he kind of held that back from the Jews, didn't he? And so we know that Joseph was a, a rich but a secret disciple of Jesus Christ. We know that, that Joseph was a reptile member of the Sanhedrin, but yet he was untamed by their wickedness. And number three, he was a good and a righteous man, the Bible says, looking for the kingdom of God. So the Jews, had, we've already gone through this. In Mark chapter 15, verse 44, And Pilate marveled if he were already dead, and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he uh, uh, had been uh, uh, any while dead. How long has he been dead? You sure he's not just passed out? So Joseph is given the lifeless body of the Savior. Matthew chapter 27, verse 58 through 59. He went to Pilate. He begged for the body of Jesus. Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. 
And he, and when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Mark chapter 15, verse 45. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. What did he know? When the centurion soldier came back and everything, Lady Carol, uh, he came back to Pilate and said, dude, I'm telling you, he's dead. I mean, if there's dead, dead, he's dead. He is D-E-A-D. -E he, I mean, he's gone. So the Bible says in Mark 15, 45, and when he knew it of the centurion, the centurion, that is the number one soldier that confirmed Jesus is dead. Then he gave the body to Joseph. Luke chapter 23, verse 50 through 22. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. The same had not consent to the counsel of the deed of them. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who, all, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and begged for the body of Jesus. Now, I'm just reconfirming scripture with you. Okay? John 19, verse 38. And after this, Joseph Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for the fear of the Jews, besought Pilate, and that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and he took the body of Jesus. So we've been talking about from Calvary to the tomb. Okay? So what does he do? Out of extreme respect and of extreme honor, Joseph gently, meticulously, takes the body down from the cross. He didn't just yank him off, dump him in the He carefully honored him as a savior by gently, gently. Now, what does that mean? But James, he's dead. It wouldn't matter if you just yanked him off the cross. But Joseph knew this was the savior. He gently takes the body down from the cross and he brings a roll of fine cloth, extremely expensive cloth. He's aided by Nicodemus who comes, now this is important, he comes with 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes. Now why is that important? So Joseph and Nicodemus, these two men, they wrap the body of Jesus in clean, expensive linen cloths and with some spices. So the custom, here it is, the custom was to use about half as much pounds of spices as the weight of the body being prepared. So let's think about this. So our Lord must have weighed between 190 to 200 pounds. You know, I, I personally, I'm, Brother James, I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm, up, I'm close to that 200-pound mark, right? But the body would be prepared by rubbing it with myrrh and alice, and guess what? They wrapped it with linen strips that you would use for a dead body. That was the custom. And the process, guess what? It would begin with the finger, and then from wrapping of the finger... They began to wrap all of the hands, all of this. They wound up putting it together like a mummy. They would wrap it all up, right? So the process would begin with a finger, and then with the rest, the body would follow. So the Jews requested that Pilate complete the execution of the thieves in Christ before this happened again. The Old Testament prophecy that his bones would not be broken. The Old Testament prophecy that he would be stared at at death. And then Pilate questions the centurion and learns that Jesus is indeed dead. And then we learn that Jesus is laid in Joseph's, are you ready? His rock honed or honed out sepulcher. Matthew 27, verse 26 through 61, prophecy, ready? And he laid it in his own new tomb, which had honed out in the rock. He rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Y'all getting the picture now? We're talking about from Calvary to Joseph's tomb. In Mark chapter 15, verse 46 to 47, and he brought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in linen, laid him in a sepulcher which was honed out of a rock and rolled a stone uh, unto the door of the sepulcher. And Mary, now watch this right here, and it says, and Mary Magdalene 
and Mary, the mother of uh, Joseph, uh, uh, beheld where he lay. They saw with their own eyes that he's there. And now in Luke chapter 23, verse 53 through 56, did you know how, it is amazing how much the scriptures talk about from Calvary to Joseph's tomb. And yet most people don't even think about it. Most preachers don't even talk about it. But uh, but the Bible shouts it out. So Luke chapter 23, verse 53 through 56, and he took it down, wrapped it in linen, laid it in the sepulcher that was hauled down the stone where never man before was laid. And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. I know the Sabbath is fixing to happen. Verse 55, and the women also which came to him from Galilee followed after and beheld the sepulcher and his, how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Did you get that? You can't work on the Sabbath. So we know that on Wednesday, Jesus died about three o'clock in the afternoon based on scripture. And but the Sabbath begins at what? Around 6 p.m. Before the sun goes down, right? And then when the sun goes down, the Sabbath is always from evening to day, not day to evening, evening to day. So the Sabbath will be Wednesday evening. You ready? Going into Thursday evening. But that was just one of those regular Sabbath days. All right? And so we're going to go from Wednesday to Thursday, Thursday to Friday, Friday to Saturday which the, the Friday to Saturday was the big Sabbath, right? But it ends at, at, at 6 p.m. because the new day on Sunday started at 6.01. We'll just go with that figure, okay? So Jesus was in the tomb for three full days. We talked about that the other day. So here we go. And it says, and they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment in Luke chapter 23, verse 55. So John chapter 19, verse 41 through 42. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And the garden, a new sepulcher, where it was never man yet laid. That, it says, there laid they Jesus, be, therefore, because the Jews' preparation day, the Sabbath, for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. It was, it was very close. So here's Calvary. Here's this beautiful garden. And over here is a brand new tomb. Okay? So the two men rolled a great stone against the door and they left. They departed. And the two Marys, we have two men and two Marys. The two Marys, Magdalene and possibly Jesus' mother Mary, uh, they lingered near the tomb for a while uh, before they departed. So let's, let's do a recap. Okay? So, Number one, the Jews requested that Pilate complete the execution of the thieves and Christ before the Sabbath begins. Number two, the Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled that his bones would not be broken. Number three, Old Testament prophecy fulfilled that he, that he would be stared at, at death. And then, the, the, number four, Pilate questions the centurions and learns that Jesus is indeed dead. And number five, Jesus is laid in Joseph's rock honed out sepulcher, and number five, Old Testament prophecies fulfilled that he would be buried with the rich. Isaiah 53, 9. Don't you love this Bible study? I love this story. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 9, prophecy, and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Was he not crucified between two thieves? Was he not put in a rich man's tomb? So this is prophecy. Isaiah 53, 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. You understand that in order to be in that tomb, in that area, you had to be part of the elite. There was a standard that you had to follow. You couldn't put someone that like a thief over there. But it had to be like a king. What? Like a rich man, like a king. So here is the king of kings that had been crucified, brutally murdered, died for our sins, shed his blood, now wrapped up, placed in a king's tomb. Is that, isn't that amazing? Isn't that just revelation to you? 
Matthew chapter 27, verse 57 through 60, it says this, And when the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate, begged for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth, like what you would do for a rich man, and laid it in his own new tomb, which is for a rich man, or a king, in other words, which he had honed down the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher, and he departed. So everything here is saying, hey, this is King, King Jesus, King Jesus that died for us, King Jesus that shed his blood, King Jesus. And they treated him like a king. That's why they carefully took him down off the cross. What respect, what honor. And then we find the Pharisees, like on, on Saturday, they, they met with Pilate on the following day, the Bible says, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 62 through 65. Now the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees that came together unto Pilate. And verse 63, saying, Sir, we remember that, that the deceiver said while he was yet alive after three days, I will rise again. So command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure unto the third day, lest disciples come by night, steal him away, and say to the people, Oh, he's risen from the dead, so that the last era shall be worse than the first. So all this we had to put up with this religious nonsense that people talk about Jesus, it caused such a commotion. But boy, if it's real and he comes back, it's going to make it's going to be worse than what we had to put up with while he was alive. Verse 65, so Pilate said to them, uh, you have a watch and go your way and make it sure as you can. Now, we've been following the scriptures back and forth. So we see their request. What was their request? The request is simple, sir. We remember that the imposter, while he was yet alive, that after three days I will rise again. So command, therefore, the grave be made sure, seal it up till the third day. We, we read that. So what was his answer? There was the request. What was the answer? He says, you have a guard detachment. Go and make it secure as you can. Make sure that you're confident that I've got the best of the best to watch that tomb. So that can't happen. They can't steal his body. So the Pharisees, they secure the sepulcher, they seal the stone, and they station their guard. Matthew chapter 27, verse 66. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone, setting a watch. So it's sad to note, and you, this is really something. It's really sad to note that the only group who remembered Christ often repeated prophecies about his resurrection were his enemies. So now Sunday, which starts at 6 p.m. on Saturday. 6 p.m. Saturday started the new week, and the end of the Sabbath was on Saturday at 6 p.m. We know that. So from Joseph's tomb to the heart of the earth, now to the resurrection in the garden. Matthew chapter 28. So, Brother James, if if you really thought Jesus said, hey, I'm coming back, you know where we thought we would have been? At the tomb. What are you doing? Man, I'm, I'm waiting on Jesus, man. Hey, he died and, 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 and he paid for our sin debt. And guess what? He's coming back like he said. And you know what? I'm going to be here. I'm, I'm not, you know, you, you think you wouldn't even leave the side of the tomb. We'd have our own watch party for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be here. We want to see it. But we know the disciples didn't. They hid away and they didn't believe when Mary came and Mary said, hey, we saw him with our own eyes. But Matthew 28, verses 2 through 4, Behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and this angel sat upon it. Whoa, man, just gives you the chill bumps, don't it? But here's the deal. Disciples missed it because they weren't there. But this angel, there's an earthquake, stone rolled away. An angel of God set upon this rock. Verse 3, and his countenance was like lightning. His raiment, white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. They were so scared of what the centurion soldiers, of what they saw, 
they just fell down in fear. Now, I don't know about you, but that that's something that needs to be talked about. Wow. Pretty amazing. Go back and read Matthew chapter 27, verse 57 through 66. And if they don't give you chill bumps, you need to get saved. Amen. <laughs> so Mark chapter 16, verse 9 through 11. Now, when Jesus was risen early in the first day of the week, what? Sometime between Saturday at 6 p.m., because it's always evening today, right? All right, the Sabbath, right? So now when Jesus was risen early in the first day of the week, so sometime between Saturday, 6 p.m., early in that day, right? And he says this, uh, uh, now when Jesus was risen early in the first day of the week, the first day of the week, did I say the first day of the week, all right? He, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had casted out seven devils. Now, why is that? Because the two Marys kept her high trying to hang around. Right? And that's the two Marys that showed up. Now grab this. As she went and told them that had been with him, as they mourned and wept, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, in other words, the disciples believed it not. Luke chapter 24, verse 12. Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes that were laid by themselves, and departed, wondering at himself as, as that uh, which has come to pass. He's, he didn't believe it. Even though he saw the clothes and the body was gone, he, he was having a hard time believing it. In John chapter 20, verse 1 through 18, Then the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple and, and when Jesus, uh, whom Jesus loved, which is John, and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. And so they ran together, both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. What's this? And he stooped down and kind of looked in and saw the linen clothes lying. Yet he went, it says, he went, he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter that followed him and went into the sepulcher. And, and he seeth the, the linen clothes lie or laying there. And, and the verse 7 says, and the napkin, that was his prayer talit. And the net, which is common for the Jews, that's why they would close it up and that would be their closet, right, when they pray. And 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 yet on the on the, the prayer, let me just throw this in real quick. I'm going to hurry. But on the prayer tilet, there are four things on each, there's, on each corner there are these knots. And when you put, when you fold it up and hold it together, it spells out, in other words, what I've been told, the unspeakable name of God. Isn't that amazing? But when you were killed as a Jew, they would normally take your bloody tallit and they would wrap it around your body, okay? So that on judgment day, that God would look at the bloody tallit and say, okay, I'm going to go after the people that did this. But Jesus said, Father, what? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now that's the Lord's prayer. The other is the model prayer. This is the Lord's prayer. But yet they saw his prayer tally folded up. Now, according to Jewish custom, if you sit down to eat, Lady Carol, and you're through with your meal, you wad your napkin up and throw it down. And they, the servants will say, okay, they're through with their meal, we're going to clean it all up. But if you folded your napkin, it means I'm coming back. So, just, and the napkin, you see how easy it is to miss this? His prayer tally, the bloody one, even though it was now folded up nice and deep, which means, hey, I'm coming back. It says that he was about his head, not lying with the linens. It was separate, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw him and believed. He believed. That means they didn't believe until they got there, right? And yet as they, they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead, then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting. What? 
Now, where do we know about two angels? Does anybody know anything about the tabernacle? Inside the tabernacle, there's what's called the 10 by 10 room. And it's called, known as the Holy of Holies. Inside of that is the Ark of the Covenant. On the Ark of the Covenant, inside is all the failures of men. Okay? But there is a seat. And on one side, there's an angel with his wings folded. On the other side, there's a golden, because God said, I want you to make this ark. And, I, and it was for a reason. And there's other, So you got these two angels pointing toward the mercy seat. And the blood was applied on the mercy seat. Okay? So here it is. Jesus is in a tomb. And he is the mercy seat of God. And there's an angel on one side and an angel on the other. And the Bible says, I, I got to read this again. But Mary, verse 11, says this, and we are looking in Matthew chapter 27, uh, 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 verse 52 to 56 earlier. And so we get down here, and it says this, but Mary stood, uh, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. I flipped my page on myself right there. There we go. So there we are. And back up here, John chapter 20. Sorry about that. John chapter 20, verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stood down, stooped down and looked in the sepulcher. And verse 12, and see two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Woo! Man, some of you, you, your spiritual wood must be wet. Amen. <laughs> We're talking about the mercy seat of God. The angel said, do you not understand that everything you've seen in the past that the Jewish custom was, was pointing to the real mercy seat, which is Jesus? And they say unto her, woman, why weepest thou? She said unto them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him, or laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing. But look at this. And knew not that it was Jesus. Because it's dark. It's early in the morning, right? And Jesus said to her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposed him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if thou hast borne or carried him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I, I will take him away. All right? Jesus said unto her, Now look at this, called her by name, Mary. Wait a minute. She's heard the voice of Jesus for a long time. That's her baby boy, Mary. And what did she do? She turned herself and said to him, Rabbi, what? Which is to say, Master. At that point, she recognized Jesus, not as her baby boy, but as her Savior. Jesus said to her, touch me not. Now, this is important, for I have... For I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren. He look at that. My what? My brethren. And, t and say to them, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that she had spoken these things or that he had spoken these things unto her. That's amazing. Now, why is this important? All right. So when the high priest would go into the uh, uh, Holy of Holies and he, and he, and he put the, uh, the blood onto the mercy seat, you have to understand, if anybody touched him before he got to the mercy seat and applied the blood, then it was defiled. Does that make sense? Nobody was allowed to touch the what? The high priest who was carrying the blood to be applied to the altar. Jesus said in verse 17, don't touch me. Don't touch me because it will defile me because I'm the high priest. I'm going to go to the Father and I'm going to put my blood onto the, the real mercy seat of God. He said, I, he said, touch me not for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father. I'm going up to my Father and your Father and to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. So Jesus is resurrected physically from the dead. The last two chapters of Matthew 27, 28, which speak of the dead, the death and the resurrection could rightly be divided. Are you ready for this? The king is dead. Long live the king. What does that mean? 
He was dead, but he's now alive. So the king is dead. Long live the living king. So this, there was a great earthquake. The angel of the Lord descended from heaven. His uh, uh, appearance is like lightning, you know. His raiment as, as like snow, just glittering all over the place. And he rolls the stone away and he sits on top of it. <laughs> James, wouldn't you like to mean that? Me too. And the guards are trembling and, and became as dead men. And finally, they, they actually flee in terror. Now, because they left the tomb, guess what? They're now going to be sentenced to death themselves. Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled that he would be raised from the dead. And so Psalm chapter 16, verse 10. Hope I squeeze all this in. I'm going to go faster here, guys. Get ready to write. Psalm 16, 10. For thou will not leave my soul in hell, in hell, neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. In other words, my body's not going to rot. So out beside that word corruption, my body's not going to rot. You're going to resurrect it. Matthew 28, verse 2 through 7. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat upon him. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And verse 5, and the angel answered and said to the woman, Fear ye not, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen. And he said, come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell the disciples he's risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you unto the galley and there shall you see him for I have told you. So he said, now then, I want you to go to Galilee and you're going to see the Jesus you're looking for. It's going to be proof. He's alive. He's there. He's going to be walking. He's going to be talking. And the Bible says, then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and said to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him, right? But so she sees the stone was removed. She runs and reports it to Peter and John. They took away the stone. We don't know what's happened to him, all right? Then Peter and John arrive at the garden, and Luke chapter 24, verse 12, Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher, and stooping down, and beheld the linen, clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself what had been done. Then we get to John chapter 20, verse 3 through 10. I told you i got to run on this. Uh, only get like... 50 minutes. That's why we have a full hour Bible study here. All right. So, uh, so it says in John chapter 20, verse 3 through 10, Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooped down looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there. He went and he, he not in and then cometh Peter, uh, saying, following him, went into the sepulcher and see the linen clothes lie and the napkin, uh, is all this starting to make sense to you guys now? And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped separately in the place of a seven. In other words, the death of Jesus is one thing, but now the napkin over here means I'm coming back. That's another thing. That's why I separated. Then went in also his disciples, which came first to the sepulcher and saw, and they believed. They believed, right? And for as, as they knew not the scripture, that must he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went away again into their own home. So, in other words, we're giving a recap of all that's been taking place. So John outruns Peter, and, and and looking at the sepulcher, he sees the linen clothes, and Peter arrives, entering into the sepulcher, sees the head napkin separated from the linen clothes, and and, and this, I want you to understand, he says, the death of Jesus is one event, but the napkin means there's another thing fixing to happen. Jesus is coming back. John chapter 12, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So this is the first resurrection appearance. Mary Magdalene returns to the garden alone. Now I don't have time to read. But in John chapter 20, verse 11 through 18, it tells that story. And so she stands outside the sepulcher. She's weeping. She investigates the sepulcher, sees two angels. The angel says, woman, why are thou weeping? Mary says, because they've taken away my Lord. And I know not where they've laid him. And so she turns around and she sees Jesus, and, but mistakes him as a gardener. And the angel says, woman, why are thou weeping? Uh, uh, who are you seeking? She says, sir, uh, I, I have, uh, you, you've carried him away. Tell me where you've laid him. I'll go get him. And Jesus says, Mary. And Mary says, Rabbi, are y'all getting this now? There's a conversation here. He says, do not touch me. Why? 
I haven't gone to the Father yet, right? And I haven't ascended to the Father, and, and which is your God and my God. So go to my brethren. Get that. Go to my brethren. This is a progressive intimacy between Jesus and the disciples. We don't have time to read it. Now, write these three things down. He calls them servants in John chapter 13, verse 13. Number two, he calls them friends in John chapter 15, verse 15. And then he calls them brethren in John chapter 20, verse 17. So Mary runs and tells disciples that she's seen and spoken to the living Lord, but they don't believe it. In Mark chapter 16, verse 9 through 11. I'm sorry, we don't have the time to read it, right? And it was a Samaritan, listen, it was a Samaritan woman to whom Christ first revealed his Messiahship. Not to a Jew. In John chapter 4, verse 25 through 26, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. I am he. It's, it is now to another woman, Mary Magdalene, that Christ appears to the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. Mark, and then we're going to close it down. Mark chapter 16, verse 9. Now, when Jesus was risen early in the morning, at that day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast out seven devils. From the resurrection garden, now to the Father. One scripture and we're done. John chapter 20, verse 17. Once again, from the resurrection in the garden to the Father, Jesus said in John 20, 17, Jesus said to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascended unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Tell them I am alive. When are we going to quit playing church? When are we going to quit giving out excuses? When are we not going to gently put God, God, God in where he belongs in our lives and say, you know, I'm going to obey him. I'm going to love him. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to be a servant of the living God. That's why Jesus referred to them as such. And he told them right there. He says, he called them servants. He called them friends. He called them brethren. Are you a servant of Jesus Christ? Are you a friend of Jesus Christ? And are you one of them that he says, this is my brethren. These are my disciples. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. I know it's been, man, we're, we're beyond time. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I hope you'll go back and listen to this. Listen, this is not about some Bible story. This is a real God who in a real way came and shed his blood, died for you so that you could have everlasting life. When are we going to quit making excuses? You know, keep, keep playing the church thing and feel good about it? Or are you going to get into a real relationship with Jesus Christ? Father, I pray. Oh, how I pray today that you would forgive us for our sins, that you would take and heal us and direct us and get us back on track. That, Father, that from here on out, we're going to see a resurrected God, a God, a God that loved us, died for us, shed his blood for us. Now that he's prepared us, he's prepared a home for us. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that anyone that is listening to this or people who share it, that, Lord, that somebody that, that is open to hear the gospel, that the Holy Spirit of God will begin to stir their heart, bring conviction into them and say, oh, I'm a sinner. It's like the thief on the cross. Lord Jesus, like the thief, would you remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom? And Jesus said today, thou will be with me in paradise. So I, I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is God and that he died for me and rose for me on the third day and that he's alive today. I now call upon Jesus. Here it is. Dear Lord Jesus, would you save me? I'm willing to repent of my sins. I'm willing to believe in only you. And I'm asking you, save me right here, right now, and forever. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I will think right, love right, act right, and that I would be empowered to share the gospel with anyone who will listen. We love you, Lord Jesus. 
Thank you for this message that you gave us today from your word. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Love you all. Don't forget to visit lyitl.org or loveyoulord.org.